Namaste and welcome to the next episode of Yoga Vasishta. You know, I've noticed a lot of people that normally watch our new videos are skipping these. But actually, it's really important because these videos are the preliminary setups for the instructions on meditation to be given in later chapters, actually later books. Book one is just the background, just the context. And I don't know how many times I've said it. <laughs> context gives meaning. So if you have an adequate context, then the meaning of the instructions given later will be clear. Without it, well, it's going to be harder to understand the actual meaning. And just wait till we get into the real meat or uh, the, the real, the real kitchery, <laughs> the real chapatis here, they're really good. And they speak exactly to my understanding and realization. So with that, let's take a look into the whirlpool of greed. Greed, by raising expectations in men, serves only to whirl them about like a vortex of the sea swallows marine animals. Our minds are driven by foul greed from one place to another as dusty dry hay is carried away by winds. It is greed that destroys all the good qualities and grace that we have learned in good faith, just like a mischievous mouse gnaws the strings of a musical instrument. We turn on the wheel of our cares, like withered leaves upon water, like dry grass blown by wind, and like autumn clouds in the sky. Being overpowered by greed, we are unable to reach the goal of perfection, like a bird entangled in a snare is kept from flight. So this is the problem. We're never satisfied. Our expectations have been pushed way beyond our capabilities by the media, by education, by society. Huh? We are expecting much more than we can comfortably attain. This is greed. We see it everywhere, but it's especially clear in South Asia. In India, Sri Lanka, and places like that. I know several Westerners who have married Indian ladies. And it wasn't so much the girls they married, but their families were just tremendously driven by greed and basically ruined everything by cheating the husbands out of their money until they just gave up and went home. <laughs> That's why I've never seriously pursued a marriage here in India because I don't want to have to deal with the family. I know one guy who is so henpecked by his wife and family that he has gradually taken his guru's ashram and property and sold it piece by piece and given the wealth that his guru accumulated by good spiritual work to uh, become a family residence. It's really kind of pathetic. And it's all due to greed. So exactly what is stated here, by greed one loses all good qualities. And because of greed, one gets spun. Huh? Now this image of a whirlpool comes up again and again in the Buddha's teaching and also in Yoga Vasishta. And this is very, very significant. Because a vortex of any kind of energy is what produces additional mass. I call it fake matter. Huh? Because if you get any energy moving in a, a vortex, then it acquires mass, even if it has none. The properties of mass are mimicked by the turbulence of the spiraling energy. So it's easy to get energy to spiral. You just put some plasma in a magnetic field and it'll go right into a, a spiral like that. And this is how matter is actually created 
What is an atom? Is simply a spiral of energy, a vortex, our, all the way up to our bodies. And of course, spiral galaxies and so on are simply huge vortexes of energy. And then <laughs> scientists have to invent stories like dark matter to explain how they have so much mass. Well, duh, it's due to this spiral structure. But of course, they don't listen to people like us. <laughs> And they don't get liberation either. <laughs> so anyway, greed destroys all our good qualities. It keeps us running here and there, trying to get more and more and more, when actually we have more than enough. Huh? What is needed really to maintain this body is very little. It doesn't require vast facilities. It's simple. Life is basically simple, but people complicate it and they make more work for themselves than is actually necessary because of greed. So to have spiritual life, greed has to be given up because you need as much time as possible for meditation. And if you're trying to reach some impossible material targets, then you're not going to be able to have that time. You give up your freedom to pursue material advancement. So to attain liberation, you have to get your freedom back. The rope of greed pulls us up and casts us down again like a bucket into a well. Man's greed leads him about like a bullock of burden. His avarice binds his heart as fast as the rope does the beast and it is hard for him to break. Greed, like a dark night, terrifies even the wise, blindfolds the keen-sighted, and depresses the spirit of the happiest of men. Our appetite is as heinous as a serpent, soft to feel, but full of deadly poison, and bites us as soon as it is felt. It is also like a black sorceress who deludes a man by her magic, then pierces his heart. So these are strong words from Rama. Rama has seen the effect of greed. When he left the palace, or maybe even before that, in the machinations of the various politicians and ministers trying to expand their influence, they're already rich and powerful. So then why are they engaging in all of these diplomatic games? Not simply out of greed. There is no need for expanding human prosperity beyond the level of simply maintaining the body. The body needs actually very little. Just a comfortable place to sleep and sit and meditate and study. That's all. Of course, I own these toys like this, the camera and the computer and microphone and stuff so that I can talk to you guys because you're so lazy, you won't come here. <laughs> so I can talk to you personally. And even then, there are very few comments. Very few people write me and engage in a dialogue. But that dialogue is absolutely necessary. If people would become greedy for spiritual advancement, you know, then we would have something. Then we would be somewhere. Then we would have a real society. But no, they're misled by everyone around them. And so their greed gets focused on material things and then they're lost. And it's impossible for them to give it up. The only cure is to force your mind to give up unnecessary things. And all of my gurus gave me this same instruction, and I'm passing it on to you. Reduce your wants to the minimum. That will give you the time and energy to pursue real meditation. Of all worldly evils, greed is the source of the longest sorrow. She exposes even the most secluded man to peril. Greed, like a group of clouds, is filled with a thick mist of error 
obstructing the light of heaven and causing a dull insensitivity. Penury binds them like beasts with halters about their necks. Covetousness stretches itself long and wide and presents to us a variety of colors like a rainbow. It burns away our good qualities as fire does dry hay. It numbs our good sense as frost freezes the lotus. It grows our evils as autumn does the grass. It increases our ignorance as winter prolongs the night. So even someone who lives alone or secluded in a monastery or a cave can fall prey to greed. The imaginations of the mind, oh, I should have this, I should have that, I should have some position, I should have some title, some designation. Oh, I should have disciples. <laughs> Leads one to make unnecessary efforts. Uh, to go outside of one's comfortable place and then engage in some struggle to get the objects of desire. It's a shame. It's a real shame. Because that very time and energy could be used to gain your enlightenment. If you would become greedy for self-realization, uh, for liberation, huh? well, that would be wonderful. But even that desire has to be given up because it distorts the mind. The mind, when overcome by greed and desire, is like a spring that's stretched and it has a certain tension in it. That tension becomes a block to the energy that needs to flow to reach real enlightenment. You cannot become enlightened when your mind is distorted by desire. It's just not possible. The mind, again, becomes like a vortex that blocks all the higher good qualities. So the mind has to be relaxed. It has to be uh, made to give up this tension of desire and just be in its natural state, calm and quiet, without any motion at all. That's concentration. That's meditation. That's contemplation. That leads to seeing the light of heaven. As here it says, greed, like a group of clouds, is filled with a thick mist of error, obstructing the light of heaven. You cannot see the light of Brahman when the mind is tossing to and fro with waves of desire. The tension of greed obscures this light, which is the very means of liberation. The yogi, in, in deep meditation, samadhi, rides this light home to its source, the supreme absolute, huh? the eternal self the absolute consciousness without an object. Mind always has an object. I want this, I want that. Huh? It goes out through the senses and goes on a long journey far from home. And then it drags us along to try to procure and secure all these wants and needs. But these things are useless. Huh? In most cases, completely unnecessary. So the best course for everyone who is serious about spiritual life is to live a simple life as possible and give up this greed, this poison of desire and simply focus all energies, all attentions on meditation. Aum Tat Sat Aum Harihi Aum करुणार नवमाय कर्दक कदिनल गुम
ಅರುಣಾಚಲ ಶಿವಂ ಗೀದಾ